Wow, that, thank you for that intro. Welcome to Margaret. Thank you so much for that. Margaret, you, you have so much to share with us, and we have such a short time that we're just going to jump right into it, if that's okay. okay. Although you were born in Austria, your family moved to Prague, Czechoslovakia, when you were very young. And you lived there until 1938, when your mother sent you to Paris, when you were 16. Let's begin our conversation today with you telling us about your family, your community, and your life in those early years before you went to Paris, and your life would be forever changed. Well, <coughs> you saw on the, on the video my family. So I was the youngest of four children, and my three brothers thought that I was very cute and that they, my nickname was Doll Puppe, and I hated that. I didn't want to be so little, and I didn't want to be a girl. I thought it would be much better to be a boy. Fortunately, I don't think that anymore. <laughs> but uh, we were a very assimilated, rather cultural Jewish family, and uh, my mother's main interest in our lives was that we should be learners. And she had this idea that her children ought to speak four languages by age 16. And we really did. I thought that was normal until I realized it wasn't at all normal. But I had a very privileged childhood, which really stood me in very, very good stead. You lost your father early when you were 10. Do you remember much about your dad? I know very little about him because in the kind of world in which I lived, the raising of the children was mainly the mother's duty. My father was a very busy man and the only thing that I remember of him really that he liked to kiss me and his kisses were very wet and I didn't like that. So I have to tell you that fortunately, I also got over that as I got older. <laughs> Margaret, you told me that after your father died, you were, quote, under a guardian. What, what did that mean for you and your, your, your family? It meant primarily that my father, I don't think, trusted his wife, my mother, with financial matters. He never told her anything about it. So when he passed away, very unfortunately, when she was only 39, no, that's not true. She was, yeah, she was only 39 when he passed away. So he assigned a guardian to the family to look after all the financial matters. So what it meant was that when Hitler came and people of some means started to send away money illegally, to save themselves because they knew that all their money mm -hmm. might, be, um, might be taken away by the Nazis. My mother was never able to send any money away. Mm -hmm. Before we move on, um, Margaret, tell us a little bit about your brothers. Well, I have interesting brothers. Uh, as I listened to the videotape of me, I really thought, what an interesting person this must be. <laughs> and then it turns out, then it turns out to be me. Uh, <laughs> so my oldest brother became an Australian. My second brother was in the United States when Hitler came. My third brother became a Canadian because when Hitler came to power, it wasn't possible to find asylum anywhere because nobody in the whole world wanted to give asylum, asylum to penniless uh, immigrants or penniless refugees. So my, Australi my Australian brother happened to be in, in India when Hitler came and he was penniless because he lost his job from one day to the next. And so he found asylum in Australia. And my brother Bruno, who was in Czechoslovakia, still when the Nazis came in, was able to go to England. And there he found out that if he wanted to become a farmer, he could go to Canada because Canada give, would give willing immigrants $1,000 
to buy a farm. So he became a fruit farmer in the Niagara Peninsula. I'm sure he had no idea where the Niagara Peninsula was. <laughs> Margaret, in 1938, after Hitler annexed Austria, your mother and you made a momentous decision to send you from Prague to live in Paris. Tell us what convinced your mother and you to make that decision, why you chose Paris, and what life was like for you once you went to Paris. Well, the decision was that when the Nazis occupied Austria, we were Austrian citizens because, as you heard, I was born in Innsbruck, Austria, and we remained Austrian citizens while living in Czechoslovakia. And when the, uh, when the Nazis occupied Austria, there were terrible scenes that the Austrian Nazis forced older Jewish people on the streets to, wa to wash the sidewalks, to wash away some propaganda material. And these pictures of old Jews kneeling on the sidewalk and, and uh, washing the sidewalks with toothbrushes was so frightening to my mother that she thought that it, it wasn't safe for me to stay in Prague. And so she and with me together decided that I would leave. Now to me, leaving Prague was not a big thing because I didn't leave anything behind. I was in the middle of 10th grade. I was a good student, but not a very interested student. I was only interested in boys. <laughs> but some of the boys that I was interested in were not interested in me. So leaving was not a big deal. It's not like a father of a family that has to make a living abroad someplace without knowing where and without having any money. So I was quite pleased with the idea of going to Paris. And Paris was selected because I knew that if we lost all our assets, I would have to make a living. Well, I could make a living as a dressmaker because you have to remember at the time if you wanted a dress, you didn't go to the department mm -hmm. store mm -hmm. because there wasn't any. So you had to go to the dressmaker. That was quite a respectful profession at the time. And uh, so I thought Paris was the center of fashion. So I would go to Paris and become a dress designer. And that sounded like a good idea to me because as a dress designer, I could make a living in any country whether I knew the language or not. When, once you went to Paris, was your mother able to come and visit you in Paris? No, at first she was able to visit. And then uh, when Czechoslovakia was annexed, a, a, a year later, she was able to join me in Paris upon very quickly, the day after the Germans entered, before they had time to put their anti-Jewish me measures into action. And she came, left Prague the day after the Germans entered, and the only thing that she could take with her was a little suitcase that she could carry. Mm -hmm. And that was basically all that was left of our significant assets. If I remember correctly, your, one of your brothers, your brother who was still in Czechoslovakia, he played a role, I think, in getting your mother out of Prague. Yes, he helped her by giving her, by taking a risk, a tremendous risk of giving his and his mother's passport to a smuggler who said for a lot of money he would get her an exit visa, and he did. So that was a great risk he took, which fortunately worked out well. So you'd been in Paris as a 16-year-old for about a year by yourself. Right. Now your mother's with you. What was that like to be living together under those circumstances with your mother after she came? Well, of course, I was thrilled that my mother was with me. We had no money because the, the, until, until my mother came, she had been able to send me a monthly amount with which I could pay for my upkeep. That stopped. Mm -hmm. so, and, and she was not able to bring any money along. So we were very poor. 
we really had to be dependent on other people. So we lived in a, we rented a room in somebody's house and I continued going to dressmaking school. And I was learning to make patterns and designs and I was very interested in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Margaret, if, if I understand correctly, you had French identification papers, but your mother did not. How significant was that? Well, it was very significant. So I had come before, before, the, uh, before a certain date, and I got a French identification paper. The friend, but I still had to show my face at the police every month. And the police was very aggressive and unpleasant, and they kept saying to me, why did you come to this country? We didn't want any refugees here. My French friends were wonderful to me, and they really took me in and were very, very welcoming. So I had a kind of a split life. Officially, I was very unwelcome and felt very threatened. And in my private life, I was really doing well. And so, because, and so when mother came, she was not able to get a, a French identification card. So when, af when after the war started, do you want to talk about that now? Yes, please, absolutely. Um, yep. So mother came in March of 1939, and the war started in September of 1939. And the war t at first only was in, in the east in Poland. And after Poland was vanquished in four weeks, they, they turned their attention to the West and they came to France. And uh, in the beginning, the French were very, very optimistic that they were going to win, but very soon it became clear that the French could not or would not defend themselves. So now that the Nazis have invaded France, and they march on Paris, um, you and your mother were separated and you were forced to flee from Paris. Tell us about that very, very difficult, calamitous time as the Nazis were occupying Paris. So, mother could not live in Paris proper. She had to live in the outskirts. And one day she got a notification to present herself at the police station in two days with everything she could carry on her back with three days worth of food and two blankets. And I took her to the police station and I asked them, why are you interning her? None of your business, go home. And where are you taking her? None of your business, go home. So I had no idea what would happen. And just before she entered the van that was going to take her away, she put her hand in her pocket and came out with several thousand franc notes. I had no idea she had that money because uh, I thought we, we didn't have anything. She gave me the money and said to me, now it's up to you to, take, to, ta to get us out of this. What she meant by now it is up to you to get us out of here, I never really found out but it meant that I would have to see whether I could free her, whether I could get her to safety and then get myself to safety. So it was a pretty uncomfortable situation, I have to tell you, because I had no idea what to do. And as, as the Germans were marching on Paris, you, need, you knew you needed to flee, as did many thousands and thousands of other Parisians. What, what did you at first think you were going to do and where did you think you were going to go? Well, I, at first, the first thing I had to do was to go to the police to get permission to leave and they said, no way, we're not going to give you any, any, any permission. And then a few days later, I realized that there were large chaotic groups of French citizens who were leaving so there was a big exodus, very chaotic, through Paris. And so I realized, well, maybe I had, to, I had to join this exodus. But I was afraid to go by myself, and I was afraid because I didn't have permission. So 
the next day I went to the police and said, now you have to give me permission to leave because everybody else is leaving. And I came to the police station, it was open, but the policemen had left and joined the chaotic crowd. So I thought I had an alibi that I had tried to get permission and couldn't. And then when I saw this chaotic group, I was so afraid of thinking of walking with them that I took this money that mother had given me unexpectedly and decided to buy myself a bicycle and leave on a bicycle. And, and Margaret, um, finding a bicycle was probably not an easy thing to do. Impossible. Impossible. I really searched all Paris for a bicycle and finally the only bicycle I could find was a men's race bike with these kind of handles. And I was not a good bicyclist, I just knew how to ride a bicycle. So I bought that bicycle and it had a little, I had a little case that fit on the back of the bicycle and that contained a change of underwear, two chocolate croissants, my dressmaking notes, and then I had a case of oil paints because I thought if I was going to become a designer, I needed these oil paints. And that was the sum total that of the provisions. That was the sum total of what I went. Two, two chocolate croissants. Two, and yeah. I never ate those chocolate <laughs> croissants. Um, be, before, before, before we you, you continue on from there, as you were leaving the building uh, that you were living in, I think, the, if I remember right, the concierge handed you an envelope as you were on your way out. Yes, that was a very important thing. Uh, you know, in Paris at the time, you couldn't get into a big building without the concierge. The, uh, the, ma the, the man, concierge, The yeah. concierge knew everything that was going on, so she knew that I was coming and going, but she didn't know that I was about to go by myself a bicycle to flee. So she handed me an envelope that I stuck into my pocket and didn't look at. And the first day of bicycling, I bicycled all day. I wasn't tired, I was not hungry, I didn't think of my pain au chocolat. And in the evening, I, uh, as it get, got dark, we came to a small town, Eton, and there was a policeman motioning me. Now when a policeman motioned me, I thought that was the end of my life because I didn't have any, any uh, permission to leave. You know, the mindset that I had was that every policeman I saw, I was sure was looking for me. I was the most important person mm -hmm. under the sun. So the policeman said to me, Mademoiselle, take your bicycle, you can go and, uh, and spend the night in the school next door. So I was glad that he didn't ask me anything. I took my bike, I went to the school next door, I lay down on the floor, and, and uh, all of a sudden it occurred to me that I had this letter which I hadn't opened. So I opened the letter and it said that my mother was in a camp called Gurs. Nobody had ever heard the name of Gurs, but it said that it was near the Pyrenees on a French-Spanish border. So now at least I knew where I was going, so that was a great, great help mm. to me. And so you spent the night in the school. Tell us about leaving the school and your second day um, on the bike. The next morning, at the daybreak, probably five o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. I couldn't wait to get up. And because now I knew where I was going, so I left the school and started to bicycle again. I didn't know that an hour after I left, that school was bombed to smithereens by the Germans. So I was really tremendously lucky. And I continued bicycling, and after a while I collided with another woman, and we both fell down. And I looked at my bike and it was damaged, but I could continue going. So I continued. And 
suddenly a young man comes, ne comes next to me. And of course, I got frightened. What does a young man want from me? And he said, Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle, look at your leg. You're going to bleed to death. I looked at my leg, and indeed, it was bleeding. But I hadn't noticed that it was bleeding. So now that I know that the, that I know that the leg was bleeding, of course, it started to hurt. And he said, you can, there's a drugstore in the next block. You have to go and have that, that leg bandaged. So I went to the drugstore, and he said, you have to go to the hospital. It has to be sewn up. I said, can't go to the hospital. I have no money. I have no permission. Just bandage it. So he bandaged it up, and I continued bicycling. Now it hurt, but I was, I was raring to go. And he said, and why are you bicycling? I said, I have to find my mother. And there are no trains in France. He said, that's not true. There are trains in France. There just weren't any trains in Paris. So you go find a train. So I bicycled and bicycled until I found a train station in Orléans. And tell us about getting on that train. That's a remarkable story. So the train station was chaotic. There was a long line of people, and there was one window was open to give you train tickets. And it took five minutes for every person to get a ticket because everybody was going to some village that nobody had ever heard from. So I was waiting and waiting, and it was hot, and women were, there were old women fainting, and children were crying. It was such chaos that I stood there and I said, I'll never get a window, I'll never get a ticket. And as I was pondering what to do, there was an air raid, air raid alarm, and the, everybody had to go down to the basement. And I looked at the chaotic line and thought, I can't go to the basement because when I come back, I'll be at the end of the line. I can't face it. So I stayed on top of the railroad station, and I watched the bomb falls on both sides of the station, and fortunately, nothing happened to me. So it was probably a crazy chance that I took, but it so happened. It, Fortunately, it turned out well. Because it meant you were the first person in line. Once they resumed selling tickets, you were at the front of the line now. So you... I don't remember now how I got the ticket. I thought, yes, I do, because I thought I was going to Brest, which is in the north of mm -hmm. France, in the northwest of France, where I had friends. So that's where I was buying a ticket for. But when I got off the train the next day, the train was in Salis de Béarn, which was 12 kilometers from Gurs. So again, tremendous luck that one cannot, mm. one cannot uh, really imagine. Before long, you, you arrived in a little town, in a town near Bordeaux, which was under German occupation, and then you were reunited with your mother. Tell us, tell us, how it was possible, what you did first when you got to the little town, and how you were reunited with your mother. Well, so in this little town, it so happened that I had French friends who were very helpful and were well, very willing to take me in. Uh, and the lady had a car, and she had never heard, she didn't know that Gurs existed because it was a secret that there was a camp there but she was able to get her car against orders and went to Gurs to see whether she could find my mother to tell her that her child was safe because in the meantime, the war had stopped and France was now, uh, was now negotiating a peace with the Germans. So she went to Gurs, but she couldn't find my mother. She left a message and when she came back, she said to me, don't expect that your mother will have seen this because there was too much chaos there. So uh, I did not, I, I didn't pay attention. I didn't think that mother knew where I was. But I was sitting in the yard of the house where I was 
of, of my friends and not knowing what to do. And as I looked into the distance, I saw somebody waving at me. And I didn't, I didn't wave back. I didn't know anybody there who could wave at me. And this person kept waving and waving. And I still did not wave because who would wave at me? And when that person came really close, it turns out it was my mom. But I didn't recognize her because she had lost so much weight and her face was so dark because she had spent most of this time in girls outside, outside of the barracks. And my mother never talked about her time in girls. The only thing she said, I found my child and I came to her and she didn't even come forward to, to embrace me. That for her was a terrible thing. Well, it was a, it was a real terrible thing for me because uh, I was so shocked. I was, of course, thrilled that mother was there. So now we were together, but in the occupied zone of France and had to get into the unoccupied zone of France. And to do that, again, we were being watched by the police because what I forgot to say mm -hmm. that the day I arrived, my friends didn't have time to, uh, they didn't have time, didn't have room to put me up. But they said, there's a peasant lady who has a, who has a house, she will put you up. So I went to the peasant lady and, uh, and it was four o'clock in the afternoon and I hadn't slept yet. And she had a little mansard room under the roof for me. And I lay down finally thinking, I could now relax. And no, no sooner was I asleep than there was a knock at the door. And when I opened it, was two policemen stood there. And they said, you have to come to the police station with us because your landlady said you have no papers. So they took me, I had to get up. They took me both, but one policeman on either side and took me across this cobblestone uh, big uh, space to the police station. And as we were walking across the cobblestone yard, I started to cry. So I was crying going to the police station. And when the police lieutenant at the station saw me, he said to the policeman, it's okay, let her go. So he had good judgment, but it was <laughs> very, it was very traumatic for me because I again was realized that I had no papers and that I was being watched. So when we tried to leave there to cross into the unoccupied zone, we had to do the same <coughs> kind of uh, maneuver that mother managed to get away. Mother managed to get away because the war was over and the director of the camp said to people, we don't need you here anymore. The war is over. We are not afraid of spies. You can leave. Now, Goose was and, and in when the- when you say war was over, meaning that the Germans had occupied the France. Germans yeah. had occupied right. France and France had uh, capitulated. capitulated. Yeah. So France had capitulated, so there was no fear of spies anymore. And they, he said, you can leave. But nobody could leave because Goose was in the middle of nowhere. There was no transport and people didn't know where to go. But mother had gotten that message that I was 12 kilometers away. So she was able to get a, 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 hay, a farmer with a hay wagon to take her to where I was. So now when we were trying to get into the unoccupied zone, we again hired a farmer to take our luggage across the a dividing line so that we could walk as though we were going on a walk and we didn't have any baggage with us. So you looked like you're on a stroll. A stroll, right. Some stroll, I yeah. must say. And you strolled across to the unoccupied zone. So from there, you, you made your way to Marseille. Tell us about uh, how you got to Marseille. Well, 
really again through one train and another train and evading the guards that were that were on the trains and looking for and and just the, uh, asking for identification papers. I really don't quite remember how we managed to get to Marseille, but since we didn't have any papers, so when we got to the station, we watched everybody who left the train had to show his identification card before he could leave the train station. And we didn't have any identification cards. So we waited until everybody was gone and all the guards had gone and then we sort of slinked on the side out of the railroad station and now we were in the middle of Marseille. But what, in, what was in the middle of Marseille? We had nothing. So it so happened that we had some refugee friends from Prague whom we met on the street in Marseille and they said there is a flop house where you can rent a room because that was the cheapest that we could afford. So we rented a room in the flop house. We had a little balcony, and my mother had a little uh, sort of ga gas cooker, and she cooked vegetables. And she had become very passive. My mother was not a passive lady, but she said to me, "If we ever get out of here, it's up to you. Don't expect me to do anything because I can't maneuver the situation." Mm -hmm. And so I became the mother, and she was the child, and I tried to find whatever way I could to get out of Marseille, because it was still, I mean, under, basically under German occupation, and we didn't know what was going to happen. I think an interesting aside in this whole story is that at the time, you have to understand that there were no media that today, if you want to find out what goes on in the rest of the world, you go to your phone and you find out what goes on while it is happening. We had no information of any kind. There were newspapers and there were, uh, and there were film, uh, in, in the movies there were, uh, there were film, strip, no, what was it called, the, in, the information, um, the newsreels? Newsreels. Yeah, newsreels. But yeah. for that you had to be in the movie. Right. So I had, we had no idea what was going on in the world mm -hmm. and certainly no idea what the future would hold. I mean, that was completely hidden from us. And so given that, here you are in Marseille and you're trying to figure out how you can get visas to escape and that would eventually lead you to take a very risky journey over the Pyrenees Mountains into Spain. So Tell us how you did that. I got, really by luck, a Spanish and Portuguese transit visa, which means a visa which was good enough for you go <coughs> through the country but not stay there. And the transit visa was going to have valid for one month, but the French would refuse to give us exit permits. I don't know quite why, but they didn't want any Jews there, but they also didn't want them to leave. So our visa was going to expire, and here we sat and didn't know what to do because we had no permission to leave. So the last day of the validity of the visa, we decided to take a chance mm -hmm. and go to the border, which was, again, very chancy because there were lots of police police examinations. So we came to the border and they looked at us and said, where are your exit permits? We don't have an exit permit. So why did you come here? What did you think? You could leave? I said, yes, we thought maybe you'd let us go. Forget it, go back. So we couldn't go back. So we waited until everybody else left and there I saw a porter who had a nice face, and I told him our story. And he was very helpful. He said, look, I can show you how you can cross the border on foot without being seen by any policeman. But you have to be very careful, because if you, if you are caught by the Spanish police, 
they will put you in jail because you cross at an unauthorized border station. So I said, just tell us where to go. We are not going to lose our way. And of course, we lost our way. <laughs> and we went to jail in Spain. And that was a life-changing experience for me because I thought I would never, ever go to jail. And when uh, uh, the jail was a terrible place, it was just at the end of the Spanish Civil War and the only people who were in jail were teachers who the fascists thought would be democratic and prostitutes because prostitution was forbidden in Spain. So we got a cot which was about that wide that had a piece of straw mat on it and that was for mother and me. And in the morning, when uh, the jail sort of opened its business, we were taken to the jail director and he looked at our papers and said, ex-Austrians, you are now Germans. Mm -hmm. So we will, we will call the German authorities in Spain and they will take you over. So we had all this to escape from the Germans and then we were going to hand, be handed over to the Germans in Spain. But you see, I am here. So we again were tremendously Mar Margaret, you, um, you had described to me that in that time that you were in the Spanish jail with prostitutes, that there were some tremendous kindnesses shown to you that had a real effect on you. For example, I think one of them is that you had to have a, a bowl to be able, if you didn't have a bowl, you didn't get fed. And if I remember right, one of them gave you a bowl. That was absolutely true. <coughs> that was really a life-saving gesture because in Spain, when you go to jail, you have to bring your own equipment, your food equipment and your bedding and everything you bring from home. But we had nothing. And our, the, the things with, with which we came across the border were confiscated. They were, they were someplace in the... In the, in, the, in the jail, so we had nothing. And in the morning you had to come with your bowl to get the soup or the coffee that was your morning food. And we had nothing. And one of the prostitutes saw that we didn't have anything and gave us a bowl, a life-saving gesture, which made a tremendous impression on me because I thought the kind of person I was I would never meet a prostitute. And I really had to rethink the kind of uh, life's view or world view that I had. And it really changed the, the trajectory of where I was going. I was going a certain way and that now stopped. And I was going to become somebody very different. And very fortunately, because I think I became a much better person than I would have become. And I have become very aware of the world around me, which I continue to be. Mm -hmm. Margaret, you, um, as, as you were telling us, the uh, jail authorities were gonna send you to the Germans, um, but through the intervention of some friends that you'd written to, uh, and you don't have time to go into it, they were able to get you out of jail and you were able to get to Portugal. So now you're in Portugal, what do you do from there? So in Portugal, we were able to stay. Again, we had no money or very little money. We found a room in a, in a lady's house and there were all kinds of, of Czech refugees in Lisbon who also didn't have any clothes because they lost everything. And so I became the dressmaker to the refugees. And the lady of the house, she had a treadle sewing machine. She had an iron that one heated with coals that one had to shake so that the coals would burn. And I became a dressmaker, which was really very fortunate because I had to learn Portuguese to be able to go to the, to, to the, to the store to buy the notions. And I had a very good time in Portugal because uh, I was productive, I was making money for us, and uh, 
when I went walk in the street, uh, young Portuguese women of a good family were not permitted on the street by themselves. They always needed an escort. Now, I was not a Portuguese girl, so I didn't have an escort. And young Portuguese men always accosted me. And if I didn't like their face, I said, I don't speak Portuguese. But if I liked them, they, <laughs> I started talking to them, and I made some very nice friends in Portugal. So I basically really had a good time. And again, miraculously, during the time in Portugal, we got an American immigration visa. So now that was tremendous, but one needed shipping. How did you get the visa, though? That was very hard to do. Well, it was, uh, we got an affidavit from a family member, and uh, somehow, I don't quite remember how all this paperwork, paperwork really happened. Very complicated, but I really cannot remember. But we did get an American immigration visa that was valid only for a certain time and couldn't get a ship mm -hmm. to come to the United States because there, there were U-boats in the Atlantic Ocean. So finally, in the last moment, we got a place on a Portuguese cork boat. A cork boat. Cork boat that brought bot corks for wine bottles to the United States. And it was a little ship that sort of floated across the Atlantic for three weeks. I was seasick 90% of the time. But when I was not seasick, I used to play ping pong with the crew, and I became a very good ping pong player. And I also learned much more Portuguese so that I became a good Portuguese speaker. So when we came to the United States, we landed not at the, uh, at the Statue of Liberty, but in, a, in the Chesapeake Bay at a small port someplace near Wilmington. So here you are in the United States, qu quickly a whole new world, a whole new culture. Um, what was that like for you? And we were, and we were not yet in the war. Um, what, no. What, what was it like for you? Well, it was tremendous. Tremendous. Tremendous that we were here, and everything was so bright. My brother Felix, who had come here before, somehow rented a, borrowed the car and picked us up at the, at, the, at the port and drove us to Manhattan. And I was just uh, uh, stunned with all the lights. I couldn't imagine that life could be so bright. And uh, it was a tremendous relief but it was also very frightening mm -hmm. because it was a totally new situation. But at that point, I think I had already become a risk taker. Because this- That's an understatement. <laughs> That's a because this whole experience really taught me to take risks and not be afraid of failing. Mm -hmm. And I have- maintain that the rest of my life. I still take risks today, sometimes probably even as, un, uh, uh, as unsound as the risks were that I took during mm -hmm. my escape. Mm -hmm. Margit, I want to have a little time to turn to our audience for some questions, but I do have a couple more I'd like to ask you, so I'm going to uh, go ahead in, in your chronology a little bit. You, you shared with me that you, know, you end up going to college in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and, and now we were in the war. Uh, this was after no, Pearl Harbor. This, no, this was still before. Still before the war. Before the and war. The, w once you were in Asheville uh, at Black Mountain College, you said you, you started to, people started to ask you a little bit about what well, happened. Well, they, they had never heard of anybody like me. They really didn't know what was going on in Europe because maybe some of the newspapers wrote something, but it was of no concern to a city like Asheville, North Carolina. So uh, I was, I was uh, uh, a special person, and the lady I lived with was a member of the PTA, and when she heard my story, she said, you should come and speak to the PTA. 
So my first speech ever, that was how many, 60 years ago? Mm -hmm. More than 60 More years. than 60, yeah. Uh, eight, well more, yeah. 80 years mm -hmm. ago was for the PTA, and I didn't know what the PTA was. <laughs> and then the PTA heard about me, and the Rotary asked me to speak because they had never heard anything like my story. And so I talked to the Rotary, and they gave me a blue ceramic vase, which I still have to this mm. day, and I really treasure it because it's the one thing that reminds me of how I, start, I started my speaking career. I didn't really have a speaking career, except now here at the Holocaust Museum, now I'm a speaker. Mm. I wasn't a speaker <laughs> for 80 years. And the, the other question, Margaret, I do want to ask is, um, after the war, you would go to work for the U.S. government uh, and find yourself in Germany. You were there for the Nuremberg trials, and then you worked to re-educate Hitler youth. What, so, what was that like for well, you? Well, first of all, it was terrible to be in Germany, which was completely destroyed. And Nuremberg, where the, where the war crimes trial was completely destroyed, so one couldn't live in Nuremberg. But uh, my then husband worked for, for the American, uh, American judicial team and I was just a visitor, and I was very uncomfortable because I thought, but for the grace of God, I could have been on the other side. So I had to do something to permit me, to permit my mental health to be good because otherwise I would have been too depressed. And so I accidentally got a job with the American military government and they said, you can be the German youth activities, the job of the German youth activities was to re-educate the German youth. Now, again, I didn't know anything about doing this, but being a risk taker, I said, okay, I'll take that job. And I, it turned out that it was a much more difficult job than I expected because the German youngsters who I had interacted with, they were not interested in learning. They were interested in surviving. They had no food, no shelter. They, they were in terrible, in terrible straits. So my great uh, ideas of how I was going to re-educate them were a great failure. But I learned a lot from it because I began to understand the difference if you are brought up in a democratic society as opposed to a, a fascist society. Thank you, Margaret. I'm gonna turn to our audience. We have time for just a couple of questions, but let's see if anybody has a question for you. We have a mic in this aisle and a mic in this aisle. We ask that you go to the microphone if you have a question. And if you do, try to make it as brief as you can. I'll repeat the question to be sure. Margaret and everybody in the room hears it, and then, and then Margaret will respond. Um, let's see if we have anybody who um, has a question. Do we have a question here? I know, it's, I know it's a little hard to make your way over there, but please, uh, and thank you for being willing to do that. Hi, okay. So um, I wanted to thank you for sharing your story first, um, but also, and I think you touched on this a little bit in mentioning that you had done work concerning the Syrian refugee crisis. Um, but I wanted to know how you felt in our current political climate. I, I think if you don't mind, I'm gonna just try to keep us focused on Margaret's story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If well, you don't mind, yeah, I'd like, okay. if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, well then I guess the other question was, how have your experiences short, sort of shaped um, the rest of your life past entering the United okay. States. How, how, your, how did your experiences during the war and the Holocaust shape the rest of your, your, your life's perspectives? Well, they certainly changed me completely. And I think I became very socially active. I became, I continue to be a learner because I left school in the middle of, in the middle of 10th grade. 
So the fact that I never really graduated from high school was troublesome to me, and I tried to make up for this. I have to tell you that eventually, without a high school diploma and without an undergraduate degree, I got a master's degree in education. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you for the question. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you for that. Hi, Ms. Meisner. It's an honor to speak with you. When you were in the United States during the war, did you have any communication with people back in Europe to get an idea of the atrocities that were going on, or was it news to you when the camps were liberated? The, the question is, when you were in the United States, uh, uh, and then of course we got into the war after Pearl Harbor, did you have communication with anybody back in Europe, and did you know well, what was going on, particularly course, what was happening to Jews? we had no communication yeah. with anybody in Germany, and, Ger and most of Europe was, uh, was part of Germany at that right. point. But we had friends in England, I mean, with, in France, it was not possible to, mm -hmm. to communicate with anybody with the French friends. The Spanish friends we were able to communicate with because Fra Spain was a neutral country. And, and were you able to, from them, were you able to hear what was going on in Europe at that time? I think that uh, I was pretty ignorant at the time, and I had very little understanding of how the world worked. I th when, I, when I think back of how naive I was, I shudder. Okay, well, we're gonna have one more question. Thank you, sir. Hi, how you doing? Uh, it's been an honor and pleasure. I just wanna say personally, it's uh, motivating to know that we all have an assignment because you, you're proof of that, so thank you. Um, my question is, do you, uh, to this day, have any relationships or speak to any other survivors? Um, and is there any more information that we could do uh, to continue to learn about um, the experiences that you went through? Just want to know, is there any other any groups or any survivors that she currently speaks to? Oh, or, or a question how do we is, get that information? If, 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 I, if I understand the question right, are there, are, do you have do you communicate and have relationships with other survivors and, and how can you know, people learn more? But coming to this program is right. one, but go ahead. Yes, of course. I mean, I'm a volunteer here at the museum and there are about 80 other survivor volunteers here. So I have a lot of contact with them and I also have contact with some of the survivors who did not come to the United States. Some of them are in England, some of them in Israel. So I am I'm, I'm well aware of what goes on. Now, for all the ignorance during my escape and afterwards, I think I'm pretty well informed about what goes on in the world, and I make it my business really to know what goes on and to be active whenever I can to improve things which where there is a lot of room for improvement. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm gonna to have to hold off the question for, for now because of time. I'm going to turn back to Margaret in just a moment to close our program. Um, I wanna thank all of you for being with us today. Remind you that we'll have first person programs each Wednesday and Thursday until the middle of August. All of our programs in April will be live streamed as today's program is, and all of our programs will be accessible uh, in fact, in response to the, uh, the gentleman's question just now, all of our programs, first person programs, will be on uh, the museum's YouTube channel. So there's quite an inventory of those if somebody wants to view those films. Um, after our program ends in a few moments, Margaret will leave the stage. Uh, we want to get her up to the top because she's going to sign copies of her book, Margaret's Story. So you'll also have a chance to ask her another question if you didn't get a chance here to do so after that. And before um, we close the program, our photographer, Joel, is gonna come up on stage, take a photograph of Margaret with you as the background. So we'd like you to stay until she's finished. It's our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word. And so on that note, I'm gonna turn back to Margaret to close our program. Well, if there's one thing that I would like to say to all of you, don't be bystanders. If you see discrimination, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, all kinds of, of uh, um, 
un, I don't quite know. Unjust. Unjust actions. Don't just think I'm just a little person. What I can do means nothing. It's none of my business. It's everybody's business to see whether one can help situations in a peaceful and productive way. And you have to understand what you do really matters. I think that's a very important lesson that I learned and I live with. And the other thing I would like to say again, don't be afraid to take risks because it's better to take a risk and fail than never to try. So I think that one should not be afraid of failure because you learned something. And the third thing I'd like to say, be curious, because it's the only way that you really learn what goes on in the world. And there's so much to know, and it is such a great thing to see how you can extend your mind. So that's really all that I want to say.